the, the, the primary mode of uh, transmission from, uh, uh, from, from the world into my machine at, during my adolescent years was actually typing in programs that were printed in magazines. I've been thinking a lot about that recently, how strange that is, right? You know, that, that basically, so, so, you know, before there was a network to deliver it, um, we, used, we used paper. Uh, to do that, we you know we basically took a program, uh, uh, printed it out, and then sent the printout to somebody to turn it back into a program. Um, and uh, and so that's actually how I learned to code uh, was by typing in um, programs that were printed in magazines that invariably had errors in them. Uh, and so you were basically debugging uh, somebody else's uh, crappy code uh, or the mistakes that you'd made. Um, and in a way, uh, it was like learning a language in a very natural way, uh, uh, which is sort of being immersed in it. Uh, I didn't really understand syntax. Uh, I didn't really understand the fundamental principles of what was happening, but I understood that they were broken uh, because I would go to compile it or to run it and it, it didn't work. And I was sufficiently motivated uh, to make it work because it was a game that I wanted to play or it was something, it was in some way something that I wanted to do. Uh, and those were how there's a there's a kind of beauty to that you know to the way that to the way that an opaque system you know kind of just like moved out into the world uh, you know through newsstands right gets picked up somewhere in the Bronx and gets kind of like uploaded in a way back up into a computer all without uh, anybody along the way including me really understanding even what it is we're doing uh, uh, like you know like from the from the moment that it's printed out nobody understands exactly what it is that's happening. Um, the, the, the new seller doesn't understand that he's selling code at this point. Uh, and the 13-year-old kid doesn't understand what it is that he's typing in. He just understands what he wants it to do. Um, and I think maybe that's part of what uh, uh, leads to the interest in the weird uh, opacity of the systems uh, that we're that we're swimming in these days, um, I didn't really think that hard about systems and the kind of algorithmic approach to um, experience, to just fundamental human experience, until I started working with game designers every day um, at Area Code, and so that's stretching back maybe eight or nine years now. And, uh, and it was really sort of spending time with game designers who, unlike most other people in the world, are actually creating a living system that then people are going to engage for hours of a day or uh, you know thousands of hours over a lifetime, and understanding that the essence of what they're doing uh, when they design something is designing the, the, the boundaries and the constraints on a human experience. Um, and I think that spending a lot of time with some of the most talented game designers around for a couple of years sensitized me to the idea that that is a, uh, that's a subset of a much broader activity that's happening in the world. Uh, and it's very well in the market. And this is as far back as maybe 2005 or so, 2006, which is early in the scale of things. Um, and this is a, a trader who uh, had been a hacker. Uh, and it was sort of, it was the first time I'd heard about somebody who had taken a hacker's approach to the world and used it on something that wasn't, strictly speaking, a closed computer system. It was the economy um, and hemorrhage money. And they all, their pagers went off in the middle of the night or whatever the the, the, the alert system was, and they, they kind of checked it out. And what they realized over time was that their algorithm, which at that point was responsible for maybe a third of all the trades in the market, was under attack by another algorithm. Uh, and, that, and that that was sort of, that was the first that I heard about this. That's 2005, 2006. Uh, this image of um, the algorithms and systems that seem abstract actually starting to have concrete effects on, uh, on, on the real world, on, on actual companies that live or die uh, by the ticker uh, that determines their value. 
and uh, thinking, and just kind of realizing that this is a a, a quite pervasive story. Um, that that the that the ways that systems affect everyday life is not about financial services. It's about anything that connects to a computer, which is just about everything these days. And that and that there's a way to understand culture itself as being shaped in some ways uh, by these systems that have um, authors that will never know the name of, uh, uh, that have authors that may not even know that they are the authors, uh, and that will have code that they've written that will never be read by a human. Um, and that this is, um, this is a profound shift, um, that, um, that we, we think of the world around us uh, at a minimum from a cultural perspective, but also much broader than that, social perspective, physical perspectives, we think of it as mostly determined by people's taste. Um, the architecture of New York City has a certain look because certain fashions have come in and out of vogue, uh, certain architects have been prominent and then less prominent, and new ones have replaced them, uh, and certain songs have come on the radio, and they've come up and they've faded, and certain companies have come and gone. And we've always understood those things as having something to do with human activity, uh, uh, broadly, because really, what else could there be? What else could possibly determine the shape of human experience? And experience. And I think that we're starting to understand that there is something else that can shape the fundamental texture of human experience. And it's something that's sort of made by humans, but it's not exactly controlled by humans. And that it doesn't have to look like a robot to actually start to shape the world. Uh, and that, uh, that underneath it is the idea that there is a world that you can engage um, that has no consequences. Um, that as whatever it is that humans were doing up until this point, whether you were uh, a painter or a financier or an architect or an engineer or a jet pilot, um, there were few ways to understand the world. There were few ways to understand your actions in the world as being able to exist uh, uh, outside of consequences. Um, uh, direct consequences. Um, and I think the idea that there is a, that there is such a world uh, and that it doesn't need to live in your head, which has limited bandwidth and limited computational power um, uh, as we understand computers, um, opens up the idea, just the idea that there are worlds in which, uh, in which we can, we can uh, bring imagination to life uh, without uh, destroying uh, uh, a building or an, or an airplane or the, you know the ceiling of the chapel uh, and uh, and fundamentally that is pretty new you know as as humans you know we we basically have had to do that in our heads uh, for a really really long time um, and having a kind of draft mode for thinking is, has not been available to most people in most professions for a long time. So. I'm gonna bring up I think we're, I've been spending, I've been spending time recently with more and more biologists um, of different stripes. And we've been talking about the ways that, uh, that biology, like most systems of science, is, has become a kind of computational problem, um, which is, by the way, weird. Right, that human life, right, that the genome is fundamentally a computational problem. Uh, that uh, that 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 the that that the basic ideas of life are being attacked computationally. And the thing that's interesting is that um, I haven't yet met a biologist who can explain why it doesn't really work a hundred percent to approach it. Um, uh, biology sort of obeys computational physics, and then it sort of doesn't. Um, and, uh, and this is one of the things that's curious uh, if you work with DNA for a living or if you work with the brain for a living or whatever it is, is, is that it doesn't exactly yield to a computational model of thinking. It sort of does. It gets you really, really far 
but it doesn't really get you all the way. And I think that's kind of interesting because the most interesting part of that is the idea that it should. Um, the, the most interesting part of that sort of shortcoming is the idea that it's a shortcoming as if computational, as if a computational view of the world is something that we discovered in the world as opposed to something that we made, right? It's, right, it's, it's a system of approaching the world that is totally constructed by humans. Um, and we sort of expect nature to yield to it as a model. And that's kind of strange, right? Like that's kind of that, right? You know, we, we create systems to understand the world uh, and, then we, and then we expect the, the world to yield to that system of understanding. Right now, the dominant model for that is computational. And uh, because we haven't re yet reached the limits of computation, we believe that it has no limits. Um, but I think that fundamentally, uh, even just the idea of something that starts in binary, maybe, maybe that's the problem. Who knows? Who knows where the, what the problem in this assumption lies? But it's, what's clear is that um, it, doesn't, it doesn't unlock all of life. It doesn't unlock all of the universe. It does open up more of it than we've ever had. Um, it, it's, uh, uh, it, it remains a system that uh, has human authorship uh, rather than um, uh, just the sense of discovering something that has blossomed up in the world. So, uh, well, I think you know, math doesn't have agency, um, but humans do, uh, and you know, we've we've done a pretty good job of using it to wreak havoc. I think we could do a better job still, and I think that you know I look forward to what we come up with. Um, but um, there's two problems. One is the instrumental nature to which it is applied, and and that you know when it's applied to uh, the genome, broadly speaking, we can say that that's positive, and when it's applied to uh, the trajectory of a Hellfire missile, we can broadly say that that's closer to havoc. Um, but I think the instrumental nature of it, it's that we also, um, we also give it over to the machine and then let it go. Uh, and the idea that, um, that a computer is a much more efficient human is maybe a problem. First of all, it says that a human is just an inefficient computer, which is not really what we are. Uh, and it also says that, that, uh, that the machine and that the math is capable of modeling the actual complexity of the world, and we know that it is not. And we know that every time that we've given machines autonomy in the world, they crash, right? And this is a very see, is, is that every time we give machines autonomy to do whatever they want, they crash. Uh, and that is because they will always have some model of the world built into them. And there is no model of the world that can take into account every possible thing that can happen in the world. The world surprises us all the time. Uh, and that is when computers panic. And they panic differently than humans panic. Uh, we know, uh, we know when, a, when a human panics, they look for a plan B. And when a computer panics, it shuts down. Um, and this is, a, this is a fundamental difference that has wreaked an immense amount of havoc in the stock market, uh, uh, which is, you know, it's, it's, you know what, the, what the flash crash represents, what the 18,000 crashes in the last five years represent are 18,000 panic moments from computers, not from humans, right? It's not humans short selling uh, uh, and everything, right? And, this, and we lost, I think, 10% of the market in 30 seconds or so. Okay, so that's an example where humans are capable of adapting to sudden unexpected change in a way that machines simply aren't. Um, and so every time we load them with an understanding of the world and let them loose, uh, that understanding of the world will always reach a natural limit because it's, it's only based on experience. Uh, and experience only gets you so far. So, uh, look, you know, it was years ago that the best chess player in the world was beat by the best chess algorithm. Um, and that is never going to change. Uh, there's not going to be some great prodigy who's born next year who will be able to beat the computer uh, in 10 years uh, because uh, humans, human intelligence scales differently than, uh, 
than computers do. But at the same time, uh, what Gesher points to is a, a really strange thing that happened on an open competition around uh, online chess. And so there's this interesting problem with playing chess online because what was happening was is that people would bring bots to the table, right? So people would just be, they would just want to play chess online in a tournament, and then they would realize eventually that they were playing against a bot. And so then they had to build algorithms to detect algorithms, which is this interesting arms race that you see at, in every landscape in which algorithms are let loose is, is that uh, that arms race immediately escalates. And so that happened in chess, among other things, until eventually somebody instituted an online chess tournament that where they said, listen, you can bring teams of as many people as you want, as many algorithms as you want, whatever you want. What, however you want to attack this, attack this. And so, and it's Kasparov who wrote about this. Uh, and Kasparov wrote about it and he said, he, said, uh, he said this thing that was not very surprising to him because he's Gary Kasparov, but it's surprising to the rest of us, which is that the best chess algorithm in the world was pretty easily beat by a, by a, a chess grandmaster working together with an algorithm. It's not surprising. He says that what is surprising is, is that who won the tournament turned out to be, I think it was three amateurs working with a couple laptops running like, let's say, 10 different algorithms. And that that's who won. And that who won was actually this weird combination of a bunch of amateurs with like a duffel bag full of laptops. Uh, and um, so, so yeah, so that turns out to be the smartest computer in the world is a bunch of people working together in cooperation with a bunch of machines. Uh, and it's the ability for humans to be able to model all of the infinite what ifs, but to use that very quirky aspect of not just human intelligence, but networked human intelligence to do things that no computer can possibly defend against. And that's really interesting. And as soon as you hear it, you know that it's true. Um, and I think that what it does is it, is, it, is it forces a reconsideration of human intelligence from something that, that a person has to something that people have. Um, and, that it, um, and that in a way, the most valuable thing the computer has done has been to network uh, human intelligence. Uh, that turns out to be far more powerful than all of the data crunching that's happening on the back end. Uh, and that, you know, it, it may be that the greatest advances in what we would call artificial intelligence may be happening in a way that we don't even recognize it, right? They, it may be happening uh, in the ways that we are all getting smarter uh, through each other uh, in ways that we could never have imagined uh, before. Um, and you see, it in, uh, you see it in the ways that the, the CIA was using a relatively simplistic algorithm to mask the um, the extraordinary rendition flights. Uh, they were they were using they were basically scrambling and reassigning the numbers on the airplanes that they were using. They would repaint them in the hangar, uh, and so so that airplanes that uh, would sort of disappear off of the off of the roster and then sort of reappear somewhere else. And so this was a way that they were able to mask. Uh, effectively an illegal activity using uh, a simple simple algorithm. And yet they got beat by a bunch of amateur plane spotters around the world who were just taking photographs of planes because that's what they love to do and because they were talking to each other and because they were posting images to each other and just realizing that this doesn't really line up, that this doesn't work. And that's another example of where networked human intelligence beat the computer. Uh, and also, by the way, beat you know a covert system, right? Uh, of what happens when humans work with computers uh, uh, is so much more effective uh, than any than anything that any human could aspire to or that any computer could aspire to. And for me, that's actually a very exciting future. I'm very interested in that. Are basically, you know, there's a way to understand Sal Lewitt wall drawings as uh, as passing an algorithm, right? I mean, like, you know, it, uh, it's uh, it's mundane to talk about it like that, but that's effectively what's happening. And what, uh, what, what sort of forward thinking artists and curators 40 years ago were sort of foreseeing and what has really come true is that 
what the shift that will happen will be the shift from artists making things that reflect their vision of the world, which is what artists do for a living, to actually making tools that allow other people to see as they see, right? And it's, it's, it's fascinating and it's powerful. You know, it's, it's basically what an artist does is when, they, when, they, when they're effective, is they make a model of perception, whether that's pointillism, whether that's cubism, uh, whether it's abstract expressionism, it's a model for perception of the world. And it used to be that they had to make an artifact to represent that. And now they can make a tool to produce that. And that is such a beautiful and radical shift for what creativity means and does, right? To be able to produce a, an, an, an active perceptual model of the world and to be able to distribute that for other people to use is exactly what, what artists have been trying to do for as long as they've been artists. Uh, and I think it's a really, really beautiful time uh, for that. <clears throat> well, I think, I mean, one of the things that, one of the things that technologies are allowing us to do is to actually map like the deep deficiencies and limits of human perception. Um, and, you know, I think we're all familiar at this point with the selective attention tests that are used to where they have you count the number of basketball passes that move back and forth between somebody and it turns out that there's a gorilla in the room. Uh, and I think that um, more and more we're beginning to recognize that uh, that there is that that human perception is so deeply flawed uh, in ways that we couldn't in ways that are are really really uncomfortable to recognize right the gorilla in the room is a very uncomfortable thing to come to terms with right that 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 fifty percent of people who take the test don't see it um, and uh, and the thing that's I think the thing that's unnerving about a computational approach and big data and so on and so forth is that um, it's, it doesn't have the same deficiencies as human perception has. It has different deficiencies, but it sort of sees everything. If there was a gorilla in the room, it would see it, right? It would, it would, it would, it would have that data, right? And you could query it uh, and uh, it would return that value. Whereas a human wouldn't, or at least 50% of all humans wouldn't. Um, so we're becoming aware that there's a big difference between a human perceptual model and a computationally perceptual perceptual model. Um, it, like we're already we're already you know many dollars short on understanding the reality immediately around us, let alone you know deeper questions into it. Um, so I think that I think that this this question of what reality is is shifting as we as we delegate the questions around it to data. Uh, but uh, but data has its own shortcomings uh, in that, uh, and and most of all, uh, will only return the gorilla value if you query it, um, and so it still relies on a fundamental human uh, ability to even ask the right questions, which we have generally proven bad at. You know, as uh, at least for me, it's always been useful when working to know exactly what it is you don't want to do. Sometimes when you're trying to figure out what to do, it's helpful to figure out what you so specifically don't want to do. And in that moment, the thing that we so specifically did not want to do was called second life, right? That was sort of the opposite of everything that we cared about and, and could imagine as meaningful. And what it was about second life is it said, uh, the way that we will simulate uh, the, the, a, a set of experiences that you've never had before will be through the mimetic reproduction of the world for your eye. And that is such narrow bandwidth, right? It's such a, it's such a, it's such a narrow idea of how reality is formed in the human mind. Um, and what we were interested in was, well, how else is reality formed in a way? And you know, the, uh, you know what happens if you're being chased by something that just has presence on a, on a really rudimentary uh, uh, screen. Um, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't look like a ghost, but it moves like a ghost through space. Um, uh, what happens, it, you know, it might only be eight pixels by eight pixels. You know, it might not be more uh, convincing uh, 
um, uh, from a mimetic perspective than the ship in asteroids, right? Which doesn't really look like a ship and certainly uh, doesn't have any emotional qualities that we would normally associate with. But you are devastated when it's crushed by an asteroid. And that's what happens in games, is, is that you actually inhabit the, 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 the character or the scenario. You actually, you become something within that. And it doesn't need to look like much at all. Uh, in, uh, you, don't, you don't put on a crown to play chess. You, you just, you, you inhabit uh, uh, this small army in front of you. Um, you, don't, you don't need to, uh, uh, the, the pieces in Go uh, don't need faces on them to be meaningful to you when you lose them. Uh, so, so this is what games do in general. And what we were interested in is, well, what happens when you can start to, when those systems of inhabiting something start to actually touch the real world, whether that's through GP. I, to this day, I've never felt anything as real you know, as real as when we were testing a bunch of phones. This is when we had a, a game that had a ghost that would move through physical space, trackable uh, through the phone. We had a bunch of phones that we were testing it with and we had the phones on the table and the, the, the ghost moved, happened to move through the room in that moment and all the phones vibrated and fell off the table and it felt like something was there, right? In a way that uh, there's no image that you could show me of a ghost that could be that convincing, right? There's no, there's no, and, and there are a few stories that you can tell me about ghosts that will make it that real, right? And that, this ability to actually sort of start to touch your, your movement, your actual experience in life, as opposed to just a screen in front of you, that's what we were interested in. Um, and I think the time, right? I mean, you know, like that's the, the, the fundamental, ethos of the connect uh, is that there's, it's, it's you yourself uh, that is somehow having agency on what happens in the game. It's no longer mediated through a controller. Um, these, are the, these are the types of experiences that I feel like we were just sort of like poking at and prototyping and, and beginning to play around with. And um, I think that, I think that uh, there's, there's so much further to go in all of this because there's, meanwhile, there's a race you know, to make the most realistic representation of human skin. You know, there's a race to get hair to look exactly right or to get the water to displace exactly correctly. And I think there's a much more, there's a much slower and more interesting stroll, you know, to move through about the ways that uh, we can actually be made to, to inhabit worlds that sort of sit right on top of our own um, uh, and don't necessarily look like anything at all. Um, I used to, but I used to go to performances from the Wooster Group um, uh, and to theater that uh, refused to give over uh, to conventional ideas of suspension of disbelief. Theater that would acknowledge that there were people in the theater, theater that acknowledged that this actor is clearly not this person, uh, these types of things. And this was, um, this way of, uh, there was, it established for me growing up a kind of um, distaste, if not contempt, for conventional theater, uh, where I'm supposed to really believe that this person is in fact Richard III, um, which I still have a hard time with. I, I, I have a, I, ha, I, I really have our time with it. What I, what I grew up on uh, in, uh, in a minimum at theater was this weird acknowledgement of the tension between the things that are this way and are not exactly this way. Uh, and, uh, and a weird kind of acknowledgement that says uh, uh, it in fact grows in its power uh, if you make the acknowledgement that this is not real. Um, and I think that, uh, at, you know, games didn't really have that capability until they could touch uh, the world that you're in, and now they do. Um, our stories have power with humans because we feel human agency behind them. And that once you start introducing a system level approach into that, there's a there's a complexity to that that has been poorly served thus far. 
um, arbitrary. If you know that it's not uh, a human decision that provides meaning to that ending, what meaning does it have? Right? That, that basically what's happening in storytelling is the transmission of something from one person's head to many people's heads. And if it's not coming from somebody's head, the question is how to give it weight. The question is how to give it meaning. Right? And you see like, you see like the guys at, uh, at, at Nanex, right? And these are, the, these are the data scientists who are like going into the stock market, who have a much better sense of what's happening in the market at this point than the SEC does. And the interesting thing to me is that for a while, they don't do this anymore, but for a while, they would pull out algorithms that they found and they would, uh, they would give them a name and they would sort of like, and they would just put them up on a, on a blog, right? And it doesn't really help you understand what is happening in the stock market. And it doesn't really help you understand what this algorithm even does or who made it or what, but they're doing something that's really fundamental, which is that when there is stuff that comes out that doesn't have human agency or authority behind it, we, we give it some, you know, it's like, because that's the only way that we can even make sense of it, right? So it's like when they call something the Boston Shuffler or when they call something the Castle Wall, they're putting, a, they're shaping something that is, that is not shaped, it, they're, they're shaping something into, uh, uh, some, into, a, into a format that humans can process. Um, and, um, and, you know, I think about it as like, uh, in the same way that uh, a JPEG is a, a lossy compression algorithm, it's not exactly what that picture is, but it is what's efficient to move it through the pipe. A story, when a human transmits it, is the same thing. We leave out things, we put in things that aren't exactly true, we fill in these gaps, we, we break the timeline, but we do that because that is the most efficient way to move it from one head to another. And those aren't algorithmic processes. Um, those come from intuitive understanding uh, of, uh, and in fact, a kind of limbic response uh, of, uh, of humans to humans. Um, uh, it's something that happens in between uh, a writer and a reader, or a storyteller and the audience, uh, or what have you. There are, if you give them uh, a bunch of data from, uh, from, a, from a ball game, they will produce a very convincing piece of sports journalism um, that will tell you what happened in that. If you give them a resume, they will give you a very convincing uh, uh, sort of analysis of who that person is. Uh, if you give them a bunch of financial data, they can produce a written report to tell you a story of how that company is doing. Now, the thing that's interesting about that is, so for example, something like the, 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 the story of what happened in that baseball game. Well, it's different if it's in the home team paper as opposed to the away game paper, right? And so, in fact, you need sort of two different algorithms. You need the home algorithm and you need the away algorithm just to write a baseball story. Right? And that's a very simple one. And the interesting thing about that is, is that these stories are being written without bylines, right? Because they have the authority of algorithmic determination, right? And this is one of the things, right? This is that in every other aspect of life, we always look for the byline to figure out what the meaning of the thing is, right? It's like, it's not just what the story is, it's also who's telling it. It's also how it's told. And once you remove that, it's hard to figure out where meaning comes from, right? I think that we'll see interesting hybrid forms that like every other form of uh, engagement with a computer will become more interesting as humans and computers start to work together. But, uh, but I'm very dubious uh, and a bit suspicious uh, of the algorithmization of storytelling. So uh, that if, if what we are seeking to do when we do that is to model the complexity of the human brain and human experience, uh, I think that we will find, we have found uh, the, the, the very tangible limits of that. Uh, uh, and it's not that it needs to be faster or, uh, or bigger in order to do that. Um, they will be able to solve Jeopardy problems uh, far better. They will be able to fly a jet fighter far better uh, because those are fundamental physics. Um, uh, even, even Jeopardy, uh, those are fundamental physics at the level of information.
But that's not what happens when we write poetry. Uh, it's not what happens when we make art. Um, what we're doing uh, when it works is we're doing something that's quite unexpected. Uh, we're doing something uh, when it works, you know, when something touches you, it is in fact, it is meaningful because it's a thought that has never been thought before. Uh, and that's not what computers are good at. They're good at simulating every possible thought based on every possible thought that has been thought. Um, they're terrible at coming up with a new one because they're not processing the world the way we are. Uh, what, it, you know, what computers are doing when they think doesn't look like thinking as we would understand it. Uh, it's, it, it produces results uh, that are the same results that come from thinking, but that's not thinking. Uh, and there's, we understand that so poorly, thank God, even in humans, uh, that it's not even something that we can begin to model uh, uh, outside of humans, not yet, uh, and probably not ever. Um, it's also not to see. I think that what's, what's amazing is that we can now express ourselves uh, using computational tools, um, but I think that their role uh, is, is fundamentally best served uh, as the thing that we use to express it rather than the thing that is doing the expressing. So um, if we look at every example of what happens when we leave it to computers to do that, I'm pretty unimpressed with the results in aggregate. Um, and I certainly wouldn't want to see uh, what's happened to the stock market happen to poetry. I certainly wouldn't want to see what's happened to the stock market happen to art. Uh, there's never been a safer time to fly, right? Like, like, like flying is, a, is, is basically solved at this point. Autopilot is pretty good. But what we do know is, is that of the crashes that still happen, they're happening because the computer is thinking in a way that we no longer recognize. And so when it panics, when it gives up, it's sort of handing over control to the pilot at a moment where there's nothing even less left to analyze, right? Where it, and, and, you know, I look at that, and that's not a model of the world that I want to let loose on culture any more than it's already sitting in there. So.